These are your fast facts on the book of James. First, one of three men named James could have written this epistle. There are three possible contenders for the James who wrote this book. According to the list of disciples contained in the Gospels, there were two disciples named James. For example, in Mark 3.17, we find James the son of Zebedee, and in Mark 3.18, we find James the son of Alphaeus. Of the former, Acts 12 tells us that he was killed during the three-year reign of Herod Agrippa between AD 41 to 44, and given the fact that this James was one of the first apostles to be martyred, it seems unlikely that he was the author of this book. Of the latter disciple, we know very little of his life and ministry. Mark also records in chapter 15, verse 40, that this disciple was referred to as James the Less, perhaps indicating his age or stature. The limited amount of details about this disciple makes it less likely that he was the author of this influential epistle. One more James is mentioned in the Gospels. In Mark 6, 3, James is listed as the first of Joseph's sons, Jesus' half-brothers. Elsewhere in the epistles, we learn that James and his brothers rejected Jesus' messianic claims, according to John 7, 5 and Mark 3, 21, in spite of the fact that they accompanied him during portions of his teaching and miracle-working ministry, including his first miracle at the wedding in Cana, according to John 2. But somewhere between Cana and Calvary, the skeptical brothers saw the light. In the first chapter of Acts, particularly verse 14, we find James and the other brothers of Jesus praying with the disciples. According to Paul, Jesus made a special appearance to James. We see this in 1 Corinthians 15, 7. We don't know the exact timing of this appearance, but no doubt it was significant in setting James on a different trajectory because he quickly became a key leader in the Jerusalem church, as we see in Acts 12:17. He even makes the final decision of the Jerusalem Council. This obvious trail of evidence points to this third James as the author of this epistle and the rightful claim that he is the brother of Jesus in a familial and natural sense. This James, the brother of Jesus, was stoned to death after Festus died in AD 62. Second, James shows deep familiarity with the teachings of Jesus. As a half-brother of Jesus who accompanied Jesus during some of that teaching ministry, it stands to reason that he would be familiar with some of those teachings of Jesus. See, for example, the many connections to Jesus' Sermon on the Mount in the book of James. Here we find joy in the midst of trials, the importance of maturity, requesting good gifts, the danger of anger, hearers and doers, that the poor would inherit the kingdom, keeping the whole law, the merciful are blessed, peacemakers are blessed, friendship with the world is condemned, judging others, moth, rust, and money, prophets as examples, and the danger of oaths. All of these elements demonstrate that James was deeply influenced by Jesus' teaching ministry. Third, James wrote to Christians still meeting in synagogues. The early origin of this epistle is hinted at in James 2.2, where James describes how followers of Jesus should treat people who come into their place of meeting. The word that he uses here is the Greek word for synagogue, indicating that this epistle was written at a time where those who followed Jesus could still freely meet in the synagogues. Fourth, the epistle probably responds to misapplications of Paul's teaching. Although James 2 shows some general familiarity with the kinds of arguments that Paul makes, for example in Galatians, the kinds of statements he puts in the mouths of his sparring partners don't fully overlay with Paul's written works. It seems best to see James as addressing overstatements or distortions of Paul's teachings, matters that would have been easily cleared up at the Jerusalem Council in AD 48 or 49. Thus, we can likely place this epistle in the years leading up to the council in A.D. 45 to 48. Fifth, Paul and James get along just fine. Over the centuries, many students of James and Paul have pointed out some of the challenges in how James talks about faith and works and how Paul talks about faith and works. We should take note of four things. One, both Paul in Galatians 2 and Luke in Acts 15 describe the relationship between the two men as positive and supportive. Two, the first readers of James and Paul saw the same tensions that we see today, but still included Paul and James in the same canon. Three, some of the differences are differences in how James and Paul use vocabulary. For example, it seems best to understand James as using the word justify to explain how someone shows they are righteous. Paul uses the same word to explain how God sees his people as righteous. The two are using the same word in vastly different ways. For some of the differences really aren't all that different at all. Let's compare a few examples. 
James 2.17 says that faith without works isn't real faith at all. But then Paul says the same thing over in 1 Corinthians 15.2. James 2.18 says that faith is necessary for salvation, and Paul certainly affirms that same claim in Ephesians 2.8 and 9, for example. Then, down in James 2.24, we see that true saving faith isn't alone. So Paul also affirms in Romans 3.31 that true saving faith results in works. In light of these observations, we would do well to follow the example of the early church and place Paul and James alongside each other and learn to appreciate their unique emphases and themes. Sixth, James likes to use imperatives. James uses over 50 commands in this short book, an average of 10 per chapter or one just about every other verse. James is providing deep spiritual wisdom and is directive in how it should be applied. Seventh, James makes sweeping indictments against the wealthy. On four occasions, in chapter 1, 2, 4, and 5, James addresses wealth as a danger for disciples of Jesus. Now, obviously, James didn't believe that all wealthy people were not true believers. Rather, as a general rule, James sees incredible dangers in a lifestyle of wealth because, more often than not, such a lifestyle came by pursuing greedy ambition and by oppressing others. Eighth, who are the twelve tribes scattered among the nations? This unusual opening of James's epistle indicates that he was targeting specifically Jewish followers of Jesus who were part of a diaspora, a dispersion, and living in some of the regions immediately surrounding the borders of Israel. Ninth, must Christians avoid taking oaths? In many cultures, it's common for Christians to take oaths, swearing or promising to uphold certain standards of integrity or conduct in public office or for judicial testimony. In contrast, James 5.12 seems to indicate that swearing oaths is wrong. What should we make of James' prohibition here? First, it's important to note that James is borrowing here from Jesus' own teaching on oaths back in Matthew 5, 33-37. Jesus provides a longer explanation of the issue in view here. In Matthew, Jesus addresses the issue of swearing by the Lord versus swearing by heaven or by God's throne or other things, thus creating loopholes for those making the promises. Instead of making a promise they intended to keep, people were swearing on lesser objects than the Lord himself in order to provide themselves an out if the obligation became too difficult. Second, it's worth considering the application for today. Being people of integrity is no more easy today than it was in the time of Jesus and James. And perhaps by reducing Jesus and James to talking about swearing oaths of office or honesty reduces the meaning of the text itself. Instead, it seems worth considering every area of our lives where we make commitments that we don't end up keeping. Today, this passage could just as easily apply to business contracts, marriage covenants, promises to children, church membership, and so many more promises where integrity demands remaining faithful to our promises rather than than hunting for loopholes. Tenth, should pastors anoint sick people? In James 5, 14 through 16, we find yet another challenging idea. Here James tells the elders of the church to anoint the sick and pray for their healing. The language here seems absolute. The Lord will raise them up. Given much of the confusion over sign gifts and their abuse today, there's similar confusion on what this verse means for the church today. There are at least five views of what James is commending in this passage. 1. James could be commending prayer for the sick and guaranteed results. Some would see this passage as indicating that God always grants healing when prayers are directed to him in faith and perhaps with the anointing specified in the text. When the healings don't happen, people are faulted for a lack of faith, resulting in a deeper spiritual crisis for those who have been truly praying in faith. Second, James could be talking about praying for the sick only during the first century. After considering this first option, others would push back and say that James is describing a first century only phenomenon. The idea is that prior to the close of the canon, sign gifts were practiced and are no longer in use today. The church should no longer attempt to practice this because the gift of healing is no longer available to the church. Here, the primary challenge for this view is that any sign gift of healing is not specifically indicated here, nor are there any clear indicators in the canon that the gift of healing would end at the completion of the canon. So, based on the challenges of this view and the previous view, others have attempted some other, more creative solutions to this passage.
Third, some would say James is talking about prayer over spiritual sickness. Some would interpret this sickness as spiritual disease, a habitual pattern of sin or practice of sin. But this argument seems weak, not only due to the odd metaphorical use of sick, in contrast to all the literal acts such as anointing and prayer, but also because of the statement at the end of verse 15, which says, if they have sinned, implying that not all of those who are sick have actually sinned. Fourth, some have said James is talking about prayer for deliverance through death. Although it's possible to understand the phrase, will save the sick, in verse 15 as a reference to salvation via death and the Lord will raise them up as a reference to the final resurrection, this seems like a jarring reading of the text, especially since verse 16 expresses the desire for healing using the normal Greek word for physical health. Fifth, others have said James is talking about praying for the sick while practicing medicine. The command in verse 14 is to pray, but the participle, while anointing, is something done alongside the prayer. Some scholars have pointed out that the anointing with oil here is actually medicinal, implying that the practice of medicine should not be undertaken on Christians outside the bounds of prayer. In the end, if the person becomes well, the healing should not be ascribed to the oils or medical processes, but to the work of God. Although there are minor details, such as the fairly definitive claims about healing in this passage, this seems to be a possible solution or a partial solution to what is happening in the text. Sixth, others would see that James is talking about praying for the sick and a proverbial outcome. The book of James is known for its Proverbs-like wisdom. In the book of Proverbs, we encounter a number of truisms that represent what is generally true in spite of some very real outliers. One such example might be, raise up a child in the way they should go, and when they are old, they will not depart from it. Of course, we see exceptions to that rule. We've already examined this with James' statements about the wealthy. So here, some would say that this practice of anointing the sick should continue in the church literally as specified here, and that we should lean in the direction of seeing and anticipating the Lord's work in healing the sick, but that this outcome is not guaranteed in every case of illness. Again, there are some issues with this view, but it seems to me a possible or partial solution to what the text is talking about. Eleventh, does James misread the Old Testament? In James 5.17, it says that Elijah prayed and it did not rain for three and a half years. But 1 Kings 18.1 is not quite so specific, only indicating in the third year. So what's happening here? It seems that James is rounding up based on either the general statement in the text or the Holy Spirit's work of inspiration. And those are your fast facts on the book of James.